In our last video, we started to discuss the laws of equivalence for sentential logic, and we encountered three of them, namely double negation, the Morgans, and the distributive law. Today, we'll introduce a rule that is of a slightly different nature from our previous ones, since it is more general, as its job is to tell us when the other rules can be applied. You'll see what this means later. It's called the law of the substitution of equivalence. In what follows, I will give an intuitive explanation of what this rule is about and of why it is needed, and then I will provide a more rigorous characterization along with some examples. So, here it goes. Suppose that we have an SL sentence, call it X. Now, X is a compound sentence, and it could be as complex as you want. It could be a negation, a conjunction, a disjunction, a conjunction of disjunctions, whatever. Moreover, suppose that there is a sentence Y that occurs inside of X. It could be one of X's disjuncts, conjuncts, or anything else. So, for example, if X is A and B, Y could be B. If X is uh, B or not D or C, Y could be not D or C, or it could be B alone. So remember that Y is a component of X. Third, suppose that there is another sentence Z that is equivalent to Y. So by definition, whenever Y is true, Z is true, and vice versa. Okay, with these assumptions in the background, let's suppose that X, the bigger sentence, is true. What happens, then, if we substitute y with z, its equivalent? Intuitively, the resulting sentence is going to be true as well. Let's give a more concrete example. Assume that x is a and b, and that y is a. Moreover, let a and b be true, which entails, given the evaluation rule for the ampersand, that a is true. As we know, not not a is equivalent to a. So if a is true, so is not not a. So when we substitute not not a for a in the main sentence, the resulting sentence is not not a and b, which, as you might already have guessed, is true. But what if x is false instead of true, and we substitute y with an equivalent sentence z? Well, the resulting sentence will be false. So assume now that A is false. The evaluation rule for the ampersand tells us that A and B as a whole is false. We substitute A with the equivalent not not A, and the resulting sentence not not A and B is also false. So summarizing the two previous cases, if in A and B you substitute A with its equivalent not not A, the resulting sentence will be equivalent to A and B. This is the intuitive basis for the law I'm about to introduce. This law is somewhat more abstract and general than the previous ones, and perhaps at the beginning it will not be entirely obvious why we need it. But I'll say more about this in a moment. Teller calls this the law of the substitution of equivalence, or LSE for short. This is how he states the rule. Suppose that X and Y are logically equivalent. And suppose that X occurs as a subsentence of a larger sentence Z. Let Z star be the new sentence obtained by substituting Y for X in Z. Then Z is logically equivalent to Z star. In effect, this says that when two formulas are logically equivalent, substituting one for the other in any third formula will give a four formula demonstrably equivalent to the third. This is because the only contribution that an SL sentence can make to a bigger sentence in which it occurs is its truth value, that is, its truth or its falsity. Remember that SL is blind to all aspects of a sentence except its truth value. In consequence, two sentences that always have the same truth value will always make the same contribution to the sentences in which they occur. We're not going to give a proof of this law here, since this requires a bit more background than what we have so far, but in the course website, I'll refer you to a couple of places where proofs are available, at least so that you know that there is such a proof. Okay, back to the generalization. You can see it as saying that equivalent sentences in SL 
basically behave as if they were linked by the equality sign in algebra. Remember that the equality sign told you that if x equals y, then you can put x in place of y wherever y occurs, or vice versa. Given that 18 equals 2 times 9, then wherever 18 occurs, you can perfectly well write 2 times 9 instead. For example, if 1 is true, then you can substitute 18 with 2 times 9, and you end up with 2, which is also true. Or take another example. If 3 is true, namely I have 18 cousins, then the equality sign allows you to substitute 2 times 9 for 18 to get 4, which is also true. In a cell, something similar occurs. You can substitute two sentences that are logically equivalent without altering the truth value of the original sentence. So, this is what the substitution law amounts to. But why do we need it? Well, there's a detail that you might have noticed. If you look at the statement of the laws we've studied so far, they are all defined as applying to whole sentences, not their parts. So, one of the De Morgan equivalences went like this. Not x or y is equivalent to not x and not y. So this definition only explicitly allows us to apply De Morgan when the whole sentence is of a particular form. In this case, the negation of a disjunction. But in a sentence like this, the negation of a disjunction occurs as part of a sentence. However, De Morgan's, as stated thus far, can't be used there because it only manipulates whole sentences. That is, the sentences must be of one of these forms. But now, armed with LSE, we can apply De Morgan's to parts of sentences. For instance, suppose that you want to prove that A and not parentheses B or C close parentheses is equivalent to A and parentheses not B and not C close parentheses. Then we simply begin with one, right? A and not B or C. We know by De Morgan's that not B or C is equivalent to not B and not C. And we know that by LSE, we can swap parts of sentences that are equivalent. So we can justify step two by the application of De Morgan's and LSE. Here's another example of a problem. Show that sentences five and six are equivalent. We saw that one way of showing that two sentences are equivalent is by means of a truth table. However, there is another route, which is often shorter. The route is this. If you can get sentence y from x by one or more applications of equivalence rules, and only of those rules, then x and y are equivalent. So, how could you get from 5 to 6, or from 6 to 5, using the equivalence rules we already know? You can see that both sentences have the same components, but that in 6, C appears twice, whereas in 5, it only appears once. So this is a pattern that is somehow reminiscent of the distributive law. So perhaps we can apply the distributive law to go from 5 to 6. This sentence is not in a form that is compatible with the law. As you can see, the main connective in 5 is the tilde, or negation and the distributive law can't be triggered by sentences whose main connective is a negation, but only by those that are conjunctions or disjunctions. Nevertheless, we can try to push the negation inwards, as it were, so that the tilde is no longer the main connective. And we also know of a rule that can move a tilde from the outside to the inside of the parentheses. This rule, as you guessed it, is De Morgan's. So if you let not A and not B be X and C be Y, you can see that sentence five is of the form not X or Y. Then when we apply the Morgans, we get not X and not Y. So as our first step, let's apply the Morgans to five to get seven. We still have to drive the outer negation on the left conjunct to the inside of the sentence, inside the parentheses. Now, remember that De Morgan's, like our other equivalence laws, only describes equivalences between whole sentences. So, as it stands, it can't apply here. However, we use LSE to exploit equivalences between parts of sentences. So, let's take the left conjunct of 7 out for a second, and this is not 
open parenthesis a ampersand not b close parenthesis and then through the application of de morgan's and double negations we are cutting some corners here we know that this is equivalent to the following sentence not a or b thanks to lse we also know that we can exchange while preserving the truth parts of sentences for their truth functional equivalence thus we substitute not a or b for not parenthesis a and not b plus parenthesis in seven and that is our second big step so it is substitute equivalence for equivalence and apply sle to get eight but eight is still different from six so we haven't yet reached the second formula in the equivalence we want to establish so which rule should we use notice that in eight not c appears once whereas in six it appears twice distributed across the two components flanking the main connective also while a and b in eight appear together as part of a single subsentence in six they re-emerge in different subsentences finally while in eight the main connective was the ampersand and the v appeared in the left conjunct now the v is the main connective and the ampersand is distributed among the components so this seems to indicate that the rule we're looking for is distribution. Thus, our next step is to apply distribution to eight. Again, sentence eight is of the form parenthesis X or Y plus parenthesis and Z. And when we apply D, we'll get X and Z or Y and Z. To fix our minds on the right components, we substitute X, Y, and Z with a b and c respectively and we get nine but notice that nine is the same as six our target sentence so we started from this sentence and ended up with our target sentence moreover we did all this by employing equivalence rules only however if we look at things more closely you'll see that there still remains a problem we showed that 7 and 5 are equivalent by means of de Morgan's. Then we showed the same about 7 and 8, this time using de Morgan's and double negation enabled by LSE. Finally, we distributed our way into showing the equivalence of 8 and 9. However, our task was to show that 5 and 9 were equivalent. So, taking stock of our achievements, we have only shown that 5 is equivalent to 7. 7 is equivalent to 8, 8 is equivalent to 9. What we haven't done yet is to show that 5 is equivalent to 9. I bet many of you did not notice that. And that escaped your notice for good reason. In normal life, we tend to think that the relation of equivalence is transitive. Namely, if x is equivalent to y and y is equivalent to z, then x is equivalent to z. We normally think of equivalence in the same way as, say, the predicate, X has the same age as Y. If Al has the same age as Beth, and Beth has the same age as Carl, then Al has the same age as Carl. This is something that in most contexts is too trivial to mention, since it is built in our, into our common sense understanding of sameness. And the same goes for our understanding of a somehow related notion of equivalence. So, we naturally think, that the equivalence relation among SL sentences is transitive. That is, if A is equivalent to B and B is equivalent to C, then A is equivalent to C. However, although this belongs to common sense, we still haven't explicitly incorporated it into our logical system. So let's introduce a new law, the law of the transitivity of logical equivalence, or TLE for short. This says that for any sentences x, y, and z, if x is equivalent to y and y is equivalent to z, then x is equivalent to z. There is also a proof of this, which I'll also mention on the course site, but again, I won't go through it here. So armed with the transitivity law, since 5 is equivalent to 7 and 7 is equivalent to 8, 5 is equivalent to 8. By TLE. Moreover, since 5 is equivalent to 8 and 8 is equivalent to 9, 5 is equivalent to 9, this time by LSE. But 
9 is equivalent to our target sentence, so we are done. We have shown that sentences 5 and 6 are equivalent. But what is the point of these last two laws? Aren't they just saying obvious things? Isn't all this just unnecessary and perhaps even pedantic? Well, to see why this makes sense, it's good to go back to the reasons why we have formal systems in logic in the first place. And one of the several motivations is to have a system in which we can provide chains of reasoning that are as rigorous and explicit as possible. You see, those who created the formal languages we will be studying here were unsatisfied with the way in which proofs were done in mathematics and logic. They thought that what passed for proofs contained too many implicit hidden steps and too many tacit appeals to common sense, so that it wasn't always clear whether a given step was actually justified or not. And even worse, many tacit assumptions were being smuggled in without being duly examined. So they proposed new notational systems. The systems allowed proof procedures in which every step of the reasoning was made as explicit as possible, and the assumptions had to be laid out in the open. They themselves didn't put it like this, but the idea is that somebody who doesn't have any special intelligence or any special knowledge could follow each step in the derivation and could verify it mechanically without any insight whatsoever, just on the basis of the information they have been explicitly given. So imagine a very dumb machine that crawls through each step and can only use the definitions and rules we've given it. Would it be able to follow the proof? Well, if it can, then we could be sure that we haven't smuggled in any implicit assumptions or helped ourselves to any illicit steps. But this idea doesn't apply to mathematics only. It can be applied anywhere in which rigorous thinking is valued. Indeed, representing arguments in formal logic is a good way of identifying hidden assumptions or of revealing concealed steps that have to be in place for the argument to go through. Of course, all of this extreme explicitness has its drawbacks in that it can make things extremely long and tedious and that we are repeatedly pointing out the obvious. So as we advance through this course, and as we internalize the rules, and as things get more complex, we'll start to skip more steps, with the understanding that, when necessary, all the implicit steps can be made explicit. Okay, back to the rules. There are other generalizations that are more or less obvious, but which are useful. In what follows, I will use a square as a symbol that can be substituted by an ampersand or a V. You can see it as a variable over these two binary connectives. You have the commutative law that says that for any sentences x and y, uh, x ampersand y is equivalent to y ampersand x, and the same goes for the v. So the order of the conjuncts or disjuncts doesn't affect the truth value of the conjunction or disjunction respectively. So a ampersand b is equivalent to b ampersand a, and this sentence is equivalent to this other sentence. Then you also have the associative law. This tells you that if you have three sentences and two instances of the same connective, you can shuffle the parentheses around in the ways indicated in the definition. The associative and commutative rules are analogous to the corresponding rules in algebra and the role is exactly the same. They are reorganization rules. They allow us to change the order in any long conjunction or disjunction by reordering letters and moving parentheses around. We haven't discussed conditionals yet, so this is just a heads up. It's going to be important to remember that there are no commutativity or associativity rules for conditionals. The redundancy rule which allows us to get rid of unnecessary components in a sentence. So it says that you can substitute x ampersand x with x, and the same with x vx. So in Teller, page 13, you'll find an example using the last three rules. Okay, this is all for now. Sorry that this video ran so long, but there were many things that needed to be said. Okay, goodbye.